Hello everyone, this is Sarah Murray, one of the dietitians with The Village's Health. Um, today we will be talking about healthy eating with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. So some discussion points that we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to be talking about what IBS is, talking about diagnosis, the treatment of it, um, some FODMAPs or some other food-related treatments, um, some other considerations, and um, concluding today. So what is IBS? Um, it, it's a pretty common disorder. Um, it is a functional bowel disorder. So if you, have, um, if you have IBS, it doesn't affect any of your other organs, just simply your digestive organs. Um, so it can affect your intestines, your small intestine, your, your large intestine, your colon, um, and they look normal, but they just don't function the way a normal digestive system typically would. Um, IBS does, is not a condition that will shorten your life. It's not related to cancer or any other chronic diseases, but itself it is a, a typically a long-term condition. It's typically not something that goes away very readily and is typically something that you need to um, be aware of for, for, for you the rest of your life and, and try to work around. Um, our goal with IBS is simply to manage the symptoms of it. There is no true treatment, just to kind of um, let you aware of that beforehand. So some facts on IBS. Um, as I mentioned, it is a functional bowel disorder. Um, it's not caused by an infection or inflammation. Nothing really spurs up IBS that's been linked to directly. Um, there are several common symptoms. It's usually having to do with some kind of abdominal discomfort or distress, bloating, sometimes gas is involved with that, um, altered bowel habits, whether that's um, diarrhea or constipation or a mix of both. Um, it's not related to other GI tract issues um, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, which are physical issues. Um, so they're not actually related there, but oftentimes these symptoms really overlap. Um, and it, it, like I mentioned, it's not, uh, it does not increase your risk of developing any kind of cancers or GI issues in that way. Um, it's not, it doesn't shorten your life, but it may have a significant impact on your quality of life. Um, there's no known cause to IBS. Um, there are some theories on, on symptoms um, that we can go over today, but there is no leading cause. So the prevalence of IBS, as I mentioned, it is pretty common. Approximately 11% of the total global population has IBS, and about one in five Americans have been diagnosed with IBS. So uh, there is a big difference there. It could have to do with the diagnosis rate. It could have to do with an American lifestyle being, making it more prevalent. Um, it's unclear, but um, just to give you some statistics there. It is seen to be more common in women, um, and some studies have shown it's more common in lower socioeconomic groups. Um, and it's typically found in people under the age of 50. That's when that typical diagnosis occurs. As I mentioned, these symptoms can last lifelong, um, but typically we can resolve them by staying away from the foods that really trigger us, and that's why I believe we've been seeing that lower diagnosis rate after the age of 50. Um, there are typically about three IBS um, categories that you can fall under, um, but there also is an unclassified category that you might fall under as well. Um, but it's typically going to be constipation, diarrhea, or a mix of both. So IBS-C, IBS-D, or IBS-M. Um, typically, people will fall under one of those three. Um, if they do not classify you, you'll just fall, fall under the unclassified version. So symptoms, they do vary from person to person. They can come and go. They might vary over time for yourselves. Um, sometimes you might have no symptoms at all. It really depends on a number of different factors, which makes this, um, this condition very personalized. Um, so symptoms can range from being mild to severe, um, and they can worsen as you might become stressed or if you're traveling, social events, daily routine changes, diet changes, um, different meals or even menstruation cycles can affect IBS symptoms. 
Um, the most common symptoms, like I mentioned, abdominal pain, sometimes cramping, um, and that might improve if you pass gas or have a bowel movement. Um, diarrhea might be urgent, even explosive sometimes, or it might be worse after meals. Constipation, it can result in discomfort. You might be straining or feeling like you didn't actually empty your bowels if you did go to the bathroom. Um, you might have abdominal fullness or pain. Um, diarrhea might alternate with constipation at times as well. You might have bloating, abdominal swelling, or excessive gas, and you might even have mucus in your stool. So some things to, to keep an eye on there if you're having any of those symptoms, those are quite common. Um, I think I note them here as well. There you go. Um, less common symptoms are going to be nausea, indigestion, heartburn. Um, but if you're experiencing any other symptoms, such as rectal bleeding, weight loss, or fever, make sure you let your healthcare provider know. Those are not symptoms of IBS, and they do need to be in this, uh, investigated um, further by your primary care or your other healthcare providers. So we want to really see what's going on there if you are experiencing anything really outside of these more common or, or less common symptoms. Symptoms. So what causes these, these symptoms, specifically the cramping and spasms? Um, that's what causes a lot of the, the GI distress. Um, the spasms, um, they're basically when the layers of the muscle line of the walls of your intestines, um, they, they help you to move food along in your digestive tract. But these muscles might contract at different times. They might have an issue with relaxation or they might not have a good rhythm to them. So typically in a normal GI tract, we would see this, this contraction that would produce movement or motility. Um, and they would contract and relax in an even, even rhythm. And it would gently squeeze your food through your intestines, and it would become a pretty relatively um, predictable schedule. But with IBS, that movement can be abnormal. Um, the muscles can tr contract for a longer amount of time or with more strength than normal. Um, the spasms can happen in one or more areas of the large or small intestines at different times, like you see here in this image. They're all kind of contracting at the same time. Um, that can make you feel pain or it can cause your in the contents of your intestines to move um, at an abnormal rate or an unpredictable rate. Um, that can cause that diarrhea if it's moved too quickly or constipation um, when the contents are being held um, too long that they be can become dry or hard. That's what can lead, lead to the constipation. Um, you can also get increased sensitivity from these spasms. Um, so this can not only be the pain from the forceful contractions, but it can also be um, pain caused by gas um, that can actually stretch the walls of the intestines. Um, and with IBS, these nerve endings of your large intestine can become more sensitive than normal. So it is something that might not bother most people, such as gas or bubbles. Um, it can actually be quite painful if you have that increased sensitivity to those nerve endings. So you might feel bloated or gassy, um, or you might have an urge to have a bowel movement um, when you're when you only have a small amount of stool in your in your rectum, or your rectum might even be empty, and you might still feel that need to go to the bathroom. So um, those are those are what they a, a theory of what might be causing um, IBS, the spasms. Um, so so that's where we likely see that cause of IBS occurring. Um, as far as diagnosis, um, there's really no test that can be done to verify, yes, you do have um, IBS, but there can be physical examinations to exclude out other problems, um, or you can, you know, have a question and answer uh, series with your healthcare provider, and that can usually help us to determine this is likely IBS. So treatment of IBS, since it's not a life-threatening uh, condition, the important goal here is just to manage the symptoms, um, and we also want to try to minimize uh, the symptoms so that way you can actually enjoy your life and, and, make, and do those activities that make your, your life meaningful. Um, the first step for any help in alleviating those symptoms is going to be learning about IBS and any food, situations, activities that might make your symptoms worse. 
some medications might help um, to improve your digestive problems. Talking to your healthcare provider about that would be the proper route to go. Um, and of course, we want to try to develop those healthy habits that can help you manage your symptoms or avoid symptoms altogether. So we're going to go through all of those today. Um, uh, three big ones, regular physical activity is very big here, managing your diet and changing how you handle stressful situations. Um, the management of IBS relies on how you live every day. So it's those everyday habits that you um, make into your daily life that can make the biggest difference here. So exercising on a regular basis, um, this helps to alleviate those feelings of stress. It helps to create regular contractions in your intestines. Um, and basically, you want to gradually increase that physical activity. You don't want to start it all out all at once. We want to increase it gradually. And of course, talking to your health care provider about what a good exercise would be for you um, would be the best route to go, just in case you have any um, conditions that might we might want to take some extra steps um, before starting an exercise size regimen. So um, for most people, we typically say 30 minutes of exercise a day is a reasonable goal. Um, just trying to get your heart rate up, getting that circulation increased. Um, but of course, different things are for different people. Um, of course, taking extra caution if you uh, feel any tightness in your chest or, or anything um, alarming like that while you're trying to start up an exercise routine. If you already have an exercise routine, awesome, keep it up. The general goal for physical activity is 150 minutes of getting that heart rate up every week and at least two days of some kind of resistance or strength exercises, so trying to get a good variety in there. We want to maintain good eating habits, um, so some general recommendations for healthy bowel function, um, eating a healthy diet that's balanced and varied, and we can go through that here in just a minute. Eating on a regular schedule can be really helpful as well. That way you get that regular movement of content through your GI tract. Making sure you're getting enough fiber, especially focusing on soluble or insoluble, depending on your symptoms. We can get through that in just a minute here too. We want to make sure you're drinking adequate fluid throughout the day. That helps the, um, the bowels to function regularly. And we want to avoid or limit the foods that we know are um, trigger causing for you. And of course, like I said, that varies from person to person, so we want to determine what it is for you. We want to try to um, live this healthy diet and, and see what might cause issues for you in addition to living out that healthy lifestyle. So in a general balanced diet, um, we love to use this MyPlate. Um, it basically replaced the food pyramid, um, and it, it takes half of your plate. This is like a nine-inch plate. You can think of it like that. Half of your plate being fruits or vegetables, a quarter of it being your grains, a quarter of it being your protein, and getting some kind of dairy product in there that could be a non-dairy substitute too. If you have any GI distress with lactose, or you could use a lactose-free dairy product, um, the point there is getting getting enough calcium and vitamin D that we get from our dairy foods. Many other um, dairy-free foods are actually going to be fortified with vitamin D and calcium, so not necessarily dairy if you cannot tolerate it, um, but that is what my plate indicates here. Um, so we want to have this for each of our meals, those regular meals throughout the day. Um, typically, we want to try to eat maybe every four to five hours. So that would maybe look like a breakfast and a lunch and a dinner, having that balance, having that protein with every meal, your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains to get some, um, some fiber in there as well. And then um, if you're having a snack, trying to make that a balanced snack as well, having a little bit of protein with each one, plus your carbohydrates, um, and a little bit of healthy fats there. So balanced meals, balanced snacks, that's what the general recommendation is. So like I was saying, having a regular schedule for those meals, you want to try to avoid skipping meals altogether you want to avoid eating too much at one time or eating too little at one time. Skipping a meal altogether is not indicated, um, but avoid eating too much or too little, basically. You can try to aim for those three meals throughout the day or three small meals plus um, a snack each day. It can be two, three snacks, depending on um, your needs and, and your hunger levels throughout the day. Um, but trying to eat them at regular times, this can help with the regular bowel movements, can help keep, to keep you from overeating, um, your, it can decrease your desire to eat quickly, which is really helpful too because oftentimes when we're eating quickly, we're going to be swallowing air when we do that, which can cause that gas formation. 
We want to have balanced meals and snacks, like I was saying. Refer to the MyPlate for that. Uh, it can help us to fight fatigue and avoid those, area, those uh, periods of low energy or low blood sugar throughout the day. So eating those regular meals throughout the day is very helpful. So common trigger foods, um, a typically a, a general guideline, first and foremost, don't eliminate a food from the diet unless it frequently causes you problems. We don't want to restrict your diet too much because you're, those are some ex extra nutrients that we're missing throughout the day, um, and we'll have to find a way to try to replenish those nutrients if we're cutting them out completely. So we don't want to restrict you more than we have to. Excess restriction is going to be extra stressful. Um, so typically foods that cause issues um, are going to be high fat foods, sometimes lactose, sometimes fructose, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, isomalt, um, caffeine, alcohol, and some FODMAPs, which we'll go into as well. But typically we like to keep these foods um, in the, at the top of our mind when we're thinking about foods that might be causing you issues. So when you're working through um, the foods that cause you issues or trying to figure out what would work for you, um, thinking about what it might actually be. So those high fat foods, um, those fatty or, or rich foods might cause bloating or diarrhea. They might cause heartburn, um, which is also known as acid reflux. Um, and that can actually break down, uh, it, it can back up into your esophagus and cause a breakdown of your esophagus lining. Um, we want to avoid foods that are too high in fat, like um, fatty, fatty meats, rich sauces, uh, deep fried foods, pastries, those are all typically higher in fat, so they might actually cause you issues as far as your digestive tract goes. Lactose, that's a natural sugar that's found in milk or dairy products. Um, it can cause bloating, gas, or diarrhea. Most people can tolerate um, small amounts of milk or cheese or yogurt, um, but if you do find that you have an issue with it, you might find a benefit in, in using a reduced lactose milk, like a lactate or um, Dairy Ease is, is another um, brand. Um, if you think you have a lactose intolerance, there is a test that we can do to try to determine if you have that. Um, or you can use lactase enzymes um, to help break down lactose if that is a problem food for you. Fructose is a sugar that's naturally found in our fruits. Um, so too much fruit juice or foods are, that are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup especially can cause bloating, gas, or diarrhea. Um, so if you have a fructose intolerant, it can be helpful to cut back on the fructose or eat small amounts throughout the day as opposed to eating too much at once or consuming too much at once. Um, your, your provider can also test you for having a fructose intolerance as well. Um, but most people can eat three to four servings of fruit a day without experiencing any symptoms, so um, keeping that in mind. Um, the sorbitol, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, isomalt, um, those are sugar substitutes. They're often found in sugarless gums and candies, and they can typically cause gas or diarrhea in some people. So using other sugar substitutes or something like, um, like um, maple syrup is typically a very tolerable um, sugar substitute. Um, caffeine, the, the recommendation is no more than 100 milligrams of, of caffeine a day. Um, if you do have issues with it, um, that would be the same as in one cup of coffee um, or two cups of tea typically. So we want to avoid having too much coffee. That can also cause increased stress if you're prone to anxiety. Um, it can cause bowel spasms or acid reflux, so it can be helpful to cut down on the amount of caffeine that you're eating throughout the day. Um, alcohol, it's not associated with IBS, but it may cause heartburn. So if you have GI distress, heartburn is not going to help with the GI system. Um, just keeping that in mind, the general recommendation is no more than one alcoholic beverage a day for women, no more than two alcoholic beverages a day for men. Um, one alcoholic beverage is the same, is equal to um, 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of liquor, which would be a shot of liquor. So um, just keeping that in mind, a general rec recommendation is also anyone over the age of 65 shouldn't have more than one alcoholic drink a day. So keeping that alcohol intake to a moderate amount, um, and, and that can help with heartburn sy sy symptoms. FODMAPs we'll get into here in just a minute, um, we'll go in, into in depth can also be helpful to increase the fiber in your diet. Um, so 
our fiber-rich foods are going to be our, our fruits, our vegetables, our whole grain breads and cereals. Um, we want to try to have a fiber-rich food at every instance, um, at every meal, um, and at, at snacks if possible as well. So um, fiber can help to relieve constipation. It can also be help to um, alleviate diarrhea, depending on the type of fiber that you're actually eating. Um, a lot of people aren't aware that there's actually two different types of fiber that we typically eat. Um, we'll go into that here in just a minute. But as you're increasing fiber in your diet, you want to make sure that you're increasing it gradually. And you want to make sure that you're increasing your fluids as you're increasing your fiber. The general recommendation for women is 21 to 25 grams of fiber a day. For men, 30 to 38 grams of fiber a day. But keep in mind, if you're only eating 7 grams of fiber a day right now, you don't want to jump right into that 25 or 38 grams of fiber a day. You're definitely going to get GI distress if you do that. So like I said, increase gradually and increase the amount of fluid that you're eating each day with that. Um, and the right amount of fiber does vary by person, so keep that in mind. Don't, don't push it for yourself. If it's impossible for you to feel good eating 30 grams of fiber, maybe 30 grams of fiber a day is not the right number for you. So um, different types of fiber, like I was, I was kind of mentioning there, um, the different types of fiber can help with alleviating different symptoms. Um, on, your, on your food labels, you'll always see fiber listed on the food labels just under the total carbohydrates, but they do not break it down by what kind of fiber it is. So it's helpful to keep this in mind in which foods might fall under this group because soluble fibers, for instance, can help fight diarrhea and insoluble fibers can help fight constipation. So soluble fibers, oftentimes these foods are going to be foods that absorb liquid, so they help to bulk up your stool um, and, and make it more of a solid stool. So these things are going to be like apples, bananas, blackberries, kiwis, oranges. Um, you can see the list here. But um, insoluble fiber, on the other hand, are basically the fibers that we cannot digest ourselves and we rely on our gut bacteria to break down for us. So these fibers are going to really help to add volume to our stool and help in, uh, decrease that transit time. So it makes things move through our GI tract much, much quicker. And you can see a list of highly insoluble fibers here. But a lot of foods are combination. Most foods are some kind of combination of the two. You typically won't see something that is all one or all other. Um, so when you're increasing your fiber, think about what your symptoms might actually be. What is it that you're trying to, um, to avoid? And is it diarrhea? Is it constipation? And how might your different fiber sources impact that? Gas is another complication that we can see um, quite often with, with IBS. Um, everybody's body produces gas and, and needs to pass gas throughout the day. However, the normal for each person varies. So if you are increasing the amount of gas that you're, you're passing, then that might be something abnormal. Um, so, so thinking about if, this, if your diet impacts the amount of gas that you're actually um, producing, it's something to keep in mind, what, what is changing in my diet? Um, so gas typically comes from two sources. It's either the air that we're swallowing or it, it's an indication of an inc incomplete digestion of certain foods. So um, to avoid swallowing air, you want to avoid eating or drinking very rapidly. You want to avoid chewing gum, avoid straws, drinking with a straw. Um, avoiding carbonated beverages, poor fitting dentures, and smoking, they all cause you to swallow air. So if you are having issues with gas, it can be helpful to cut out those things um, and see if your gas symptoms are alleviated. Gas-forming foods, um, raffinose is one big gas-forming food, uh, often found in our baked beans. Fructose, lactose, sorbitol, mannitol, xylitol, isomalt, um, those are all gas-forming foods as well, like we kind of touched on earlier. Um, apples, apple juice, banana, brands, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, dried beans, lentils, lima beans, onions, prunes, raisins, those are all gas-forming foods. So you want to take note if those foods give you any issues. Um, if they don't give you issues, awesome, keep it up. Um, if they do give you issues, something we know that you need to avoid. Next 
So some tips to reduce gas and bloating. Um, like I said, el limiting those um, gas warming foods. So watch your portions of those. See if they give you issues. Um, eating too much of anything can really cause GI distress. So you want to avoid eating too much of anything. But um, you know, moderation is, is key there. Watching your portions. You want to eat and drink your food slowly. Gradually increase your fiber over a period of weeks. So, like I was saying, increasing that fiber slowly and, of course, increasing the fluid with that. Limiting your fatty foods. Um, exercising regular, that, that one really helps with the bloating. Um, and managing your stress. So, if you are a stressed out person, please talk to your healthcare provider about how to manage your stress better. Um, that really does impact um, your bloating and, and gas symptoms. So FODMAPs, as I was touching on before, um, FODMAPs do um, impact our digestive tract if we have a sensitivity to them. So FODMAPs, um, that FODMAPs stand for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So the F stands for fermentable foods. So foods that are fermentable in our body tend to cause gas. If they are pre-fermented, they are easier to digest. But if they ferment in our gut, um, they can cause excess gas. Oligosaccharides, those are things like fructans, colactans. Um, they're found in wheat, garlic, and legumes. Disaccharides like lactose, often found in, in dairy products. Uh, monosaccharides such as excess, excess fructose, um, honey, high fructose corn syrup, those are uh, big sources of monosaccharides. And polyols, um, those are those sorbitol, mannitol, other um, certain low calorie sweeteners that we touched on a little bit earlier. But those are essentially carbohydrates that are not well absorbed in the small intestine, so they go down to the large intestine where they're fermented or digested by the bacteria that we're eating and I, that, we, that we have in our gut. So as that bacteria starts to eat our, the food that we have not um, digested just yet, it can produce gas and it can cause GI distress in some people. So that's where the, the thought process around FODMAPs come in. And oftentimes it's not all FODMAPs that are going to cause issues for you, but it's typically going to be some of the FODMAPs that might exist. So our goal if we're trying to, if none of the other health changes that we've tried have really alleviated our symptoms, we might do something called a low FODMAP diet where we really try to identify what foods it is that causes you GI distress. Um, so this is a, a visualization for you. Um, sorry, it cut off a little bit there. So, um, so potential FODMAP activity in the intestines. So this is specifically the large intestine. So um, basically, you have the FODMAPs in the small intestine. They move to the large intestine where we have that healthy bacteria. The bacteria starts to work its way through the food that has not been digested. It starts to feed off those FODMAPs. As it feeds, it not only starts to produce gas, but it pulls water into the intestines too, which can cause extra cramping. So now you have um, gas production and you might have, um, you might have excess fluid in there as well, which can lead to diarrhea. Um, so just some things to keep in mind there. This is essentially what's happening just to give you a visualization of what might be happening in the large intestine when we're eating FODMAPs foods if we do not tolerate them well. So symptoms like we've already talked about, um, bloating, distension of the abdomen, a lot of gas or flatulence, um, abdominal pain, ch changes to the bowel habits, whether that's constipation or diarrhea or a mix between both, um, and then other GI symptoms like we were mentioning before. So if you have any of those symptoms and none of the other methods that we talked about earlier relieve your symptoms, a low FODMAP eating plan might help. And this is where a dietitian can really come in to play as well. We can help guide you through a low FODMAP diet. Um, it is rather intensive, so it is really helpful to have that extra support there um, in helping you build up an eating plan of foods that not only you like to eat, but would help you to um, figure out what these problem foods might be for you. So um, our goal is to eat as many FODMAP foods as we can without having any symptoms. So we want to be able to have as much freedom with food as we can, um, but avoiding the foods that we can find to cause you issues for sure. 
and there is two parts of the FODMAP diet, so it is quite a long um, period of time that we're going through this FODMAP to determine this, these, these FODMAPs to try to determine what might be causing you issues. So we don't have to go, we don't want to have to go down this route if we can avoid it. We want to try to alleviate it with the other um, methods that we talked about earlier. So part one is, is the elimination phase is what we call it. Um, the elimination phase is basically a four week long period um, where we avoid all high, map, high FODMAP foods. Um, and typically when we would see you as a dietitian, we would give you the foods um, that we would want to try to eat and the foods that we would want to try to avoid and talk about the portions of, of how much we would eat of what. Um, and most people will start to feel better on this elimination phase if the FODMAPs are an issue, they'll start to feel better within a few days, um, but it would take a few weeks to feel as healthy as you can after you start making the dietary changes. So you start to feel better and eventually you, you feel um, your best self. And then after those four weeks are up, we start to reintroduce foods. So this is our process to try to determine which foods it is that actually causes you issues and which foods do not cause you issues. So. Um, that's the reintroduction phase. So um, typically with the elimination phase, just to give you some ideas of what we're looking at here, um, fructose, lactose, fructans, galactans, and polyols, what would we try to avoid in each of those groups? Apples, watermelon, high fructose corn syrup, milk, ice cream, yogurt, broccoli, asparagus, wheat and rye, uh, chickpeas, lentils, um, kidney beans, avocados, bell peppers, sorbitol, those are things that we would want to try to avoid during the elimination phase um, and definitely just watch portions of certain things as well if we are going to be eating them. The, um, the foods that we would know are going to be safe for us would be things like bananas, berries, carrots, uh, lettuce, potatoes, gluten-free products, rice, oats, lactose, fruit milk, hard cheeses, maple syrup. So just to give you an idea of what that might actually look like and how we're limiting the foods that we're eating here. So um, that, that low FODMAP diet is definitely a later res, um, resort if, if we cannot alleviate any symptoms before we have to go to a low FODMAP diet, but it is definitely a tool that we can use. Um, there are some other considerations that we would want to keep in mind as well. Um, some of those include heat, so it can be helpful to alleviate your symptoms if you're um, taking a warm bath. Um, you can lie down with a hot water bottle or a heating pad on your abdomen and that can help to decrease your abdominal pain. Um, tobacco, it can increase your, your GI distress, so um, please avoid tobacco, not only if you have IBS, but just in general, really, um, we want to avoid tobacco. I'm sure your healthcare provider will tell you that as well. Um, clothes, it can be um, more, it, cause, it can cause GI distress to wear tight fitting clothing, clothing. So going for the loose, more comfortable fitting clothing, um, that way you're having less pressure on your abdominal area. Um, bowel movements, um, make sure you're responding to your body, you're listening to your body, responding when you have the urge to move your bowel movements. Um, and you, you wanna avoid waiting too long because that can actually lead to constipation. Um, you do want to avoid that excess straining during your, during your bowel movements, so trying to go on a regular basis um, without excessive straining. Adequate sleep is a really big one here too. Um, it's really important to get that good night's rest, especially if you have GI distress. It, it's actually been seen to um, decrease IBS symptoms if you um, have an adequate night of sleep. So a typical recommendation for adequate sleep would be seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So thinking about if you're actually hitting that goal, that might actually impact your, um, impact your IBS symptoms as well. So in conclusion, uh, many people living with IBS find that a healthy lifestyle, all of those things we were talking about earlier, making sure you're having a balanced and varied diet, eating on a regular basis, exercising on a regular basis, managing your stress can help to alleviate your symptoms. Um, but some individuals do need to avoid certain foods, especially in abundance, to alleviate their more intense symptoms. 
Um, talking to your healthcare provider is essential here to manage your nutrition, your stress, your medications. And if you need to, a dietitian can help you to follow a low FODMAP diet um, if it comes to the point where we cannot find alleviation in any other ways. Um, of course, like I was saying, making sure you're drinking your fluids, drinking plenty of fluids, that's so, so important. Um, stay well hydrated, please, especially with this heat that we've been having lately. Um, if, if there's a desire, if we see a big desire for things moving forward, um, we can have a uh, presentation on FODMAPs if we see a demand for it. So um, by all means, if, if you would love to hear more about this, um, let us know. Um, if you scan this QR code, you can actually leave a review for this presentation and let us know if you have any questions or concerns as well. My email address is at the beginning of this presentation if you want to email me with any direct questions. Um, and the, the telephone number is on there as well for our office. So um, I hope you all took something away from this presentation and I thank you for listening in. Take care.